Right check yet, Randy? When you whip, you don't write checks. <laughs> how do you pay, man? Huh? If you don't write checks, how do you pay these guys? Straight cash, homie. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, were you upset about the fight? Nah, because it ain't, it ain't number 10 grand. What's 10 grand to me? <laughs> Next time I might shake my... TCL is a proud sponsor of the Score North Studios. TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. It's Minnesota Sports Rewind. Welcome in to Minnesota Sports Rewind, where we do deep dives into prominent Minnesota sports events, games, trades, moments, you name it. My name is Phil Mackey, and this episode is all about the 2004 Minnesota Vikings Dante Culpepper's near MVP season, the Randy Moss mooning game, and all kinds of other things in between. Our crew for this episode, Judd Zolgad, who covered the NFL for the Star Tribune. You covered the Packers for the Star Tribune in 2004. Correct. Trader. So you mm-hmm. saw th- three Vikings Packers games from the other side of things. Go Pack Go, of course. Uh, people thought that you were a Packer fan with Packer tattoos because of this. And Tom Pelissero, who covered the Vikings for KFAN.com at the time for a couple years. And uh, you could say that it was the 2003-04 Vikings that launched your NFL media career, basically, right? I mean, those are the first yeah, two teams fair. you covered. It, it really is. That was kind of the uh, the start for me. Uh, and it was a unique experience because those were you know very unique Vikings teams. Uh, you had some star power. You also had a lot of things that were going on in the building. Uh, and, you know, that was a time where I think that – Access was a little bit looser and freer, certainly in that building, than it is in most uh, you know, NFL buildings now. And I want to set the scene for this first, just because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of context that needs to frame up the 2004 Vikings. I'm going to go through sort of a, a short summary of events and then get to our key questions, because there's a lot to dive into. But interrupt me and stop me as I go here, because there's probably a lot of things to opine on here. But this was Mike Tice's third full season as Vikings coach. This was Dante Culpepper's fifth season as Vikings starting quarterback, and he was actually around 2004 just figuring out how to be a pocket passer and throw for a bunch of yards and cut down. Because I think he led the Vikings or uh, led the NFL in interceptions two or three times leading into the 2004 season. And uh, this was peak malcontent Randy Moss in 2004 in what wound up being his final season as a Viking, at least in the first stint. And this is also peak cranky and cheap Red McCombs who also was in his last season with the Vikings as the Vikings owner. And the summary of that season, I think it starts at least from 30,000 feet. This was Dante Culpepper's best season as a quarterback, and it turned out to be his last good season and last full season uh, as an NFL starting quarterback. He finished second to Peyton Manning in the MVP voting, 4,717 yards passing, which led the NFL, 39 touchdown passes and only 11 interceptions, and a 110.9 passer rating, one of the greatest seasons in Vikings history. He also ran for 406 yards and two touchdowns. If we just stopped at Dante Culpepper, there's a whole episode to be done, and we'll cram a lot of it into this one. But 2004 was also a continuation of what became a Mike Tice staple. Start hot and then fade. In 2003, the Vikings started 6-0 and and missed the playoffs. And in this season, they started 5-1 and and wound up limping into the playoffs at 8-8. Eight and eight. They did beat the Packers in the playoffs at Lambeau Field which is what triggered the infamous Randy Moss mooning incident, which we'll dive into. And that leads us to the other big theme from the 2004 season, which is peak malcontent Randy Moss, who missed a few games with a hamstring injury, left the field with time still on the clock at the end of the Week 17 game at Washington, and he was fined $10,000 for pretending to moon the fans at Lambeau, to which he said later that week, quote, when you're rich, you don't write checks, straight cash, homie, ain't nothing but 10 grand. What's 10 grand to me? Ain't bleep. Next time I might shake my bleep. End now, quote. <laughs> that's really the part that gets lost. I've always said, even though the straight cash homie line, and I was one of, I would estimate, 10 people who were there for that. So the scene, and you can kind of see it because I know that you know the videos are still on, on YouTube, but at the old Vikings facility, Winter Park, old, it, it was there until like two years ago, but the players would park in the parking lot directly behind. It was basically off a loading dock on the backside right by the practice fields. 
and at the time, the Vikings Media Center was in a converted racquetball court wow. because Winter Park was so crammed and the way that it had originally been built, they had very little space, but they had two racquetball courts. Why? Because Bud Grant liked racquetball. So he had a couple <laughs> it of It was parts the 80s when it was built, man. Racquetball was huge. So they converted one of those into this long hallway that was a uh, ended up being the, the media center. That's where they had a podium at one end. Guys would walk in. There were reporters working on both sides. But then after practice, uh, you had free reign just to stand in the loading dock as long as you wanted to. Not just like as guys come out the field. Like you could wait them out. If a guy came out at 4 o'clock, if you were really desperate working on a story, you could wait them out till 8, 9 o'clock. And so on that day, and it was cold out, Moss had his, I believe it was a truck, parked kind of, you know not actually parked of course it's randy so his car's just like in the middle you know double parking in everybody else <laughs> in the lot and he comes out and there were a few cameras i'm standing there one of the camera guys i wish i knew his name but he's the one mainly asking the questions in the video just like trying to keep him talking because only a couple people were really on that side of the vehicle and so the the quote that gets replayed forever is the part about you know straight cash homie and then what's ten grand to me? And then the the follow up was, uh, you know, how are you gonna, you know, when have you sent the check? And then Randy says, rich people don't write checks. What are you gonna do? Straight cash on me. Of course, I'm joking, but the best line of the entire thing was, what's ten grand to me? Next time I might shake my. Dick. Yep. That's <laughs> that's the best part. That's the best line in the entire thing. And then from there, slam the door. Randy was always as much as um, – and you called this peak malcontent Randy Moss. I, I'm not sure that this you know, compares even to 2010. Now, there was a lot going on. This obviously came to a point where they realized that from a locker room perspective and everything else, they needed to move on from him uh, after that season. But – you know, Randy was also when you got him. As much as the you know the image of him is that he was combative with the media, which he was, but he would say stuff. And when he wanted to be engaged, when he wanted to be illuminating, he really, really could be. You know, he was a big influence when he came back in 2010 on Percy Harvin, who picked up some of the same things. Percy, if you got him talking, was really good. But there's sometimes where just he didn't want anything to do with you. Now he would never say some of the things that Randy would say to get you away from him. Um, but Randy had lines, man. I mean, that was the year that they, you know, they brought back the Afros. That was his thing where, you know, for big games, all of a sudden you take the, take the dreads out or the, uh, whatever they the are, corn the raids out, out yeah. the cornrows, um, you know, and, and they call it the Afros and he'd, you know, do his post game. I mean, he was, he was, he was a guy who had, he had so much energy around him that it obviously had an impact on people. It just, that was the season where it kind of set certain examples where they felt like, this is not the energy that's going to allow us to have more success going forward. And th this was also the last year of Ticey's plan to make Moss happy because that was the thing. I, I think this is post Randy ratio. Yeah, right. But when Tice got the job, the Randy ratio was the big thing of, oh, he'll be happy now. And then Ticey had this whole elaborate thing starting in what, 2002 or so, Tom, of he's going to get the ball X amount of percentage of the time. And the. Randy Ratio was born, and so this was sort of like the last year of, okay, Mike really can't control him. And Red was Red was such a weird guy, too, because Red was so damn cheap. And I think Red came here thinking, I'll get stadium built. They'll build me the stadium. Purple Pride, Purple Pride. They'll build me the stadium. I'll get rich off the team, sell the team. But this was sort of, I think, because when, when I got on the beat for the Star Tribune in 2005, a lot of stuff was still sort of festering that was left over from the end of Red. And so I would say that the best term might be 2004 was sort of the sort of the height of the um, um, discontentment of the whole thing. Like the thing had gotten sideways with Tice. Randy was going to be, you know, Randy. That That's the year that we could certainly get into it that Tice sort of lost Burke and Burke was his guy. And so everything seemed to go sideways, which of course is why in a year like that, you then come back and win a playoff game. Because, of course, you do right. when it seems like everything's off the rails. I also feel like with fans, and, and I don't know if this applied to Randy Moss, but I can just, speaking from sort of an outsider fan perspective, there was still this very cynical, uneasy feeling off of the 98 championship game, the 2041 donut game, 
and the team went into a lull for 2001-2002. Offense became not the best in the NFL again, but the offense rejuvenated itself in 2003-04. You thought you found your franchise quarterback for the first time because I mean, the Vikings hadn't had a franchise quarterback since Tommy Kramer in the 1980s. And they had just sort of been piecemealing. And God bless Tommy, but that was very borderline. Right. I mean, he was the starting quarterback for almost a decade, but he wasn't on the level of a Terry Bradshaw or Roger Staubach, the guys of that era, Dan Marino. Um, and so I think I think you started to feel like, wow, they've got this thing back on the tracks. And, okay, Randy Moss is in his prime, and they found their franchise quarterback in Dante Culpepper, and and then the wheels come off and they they want and, and you thought maybe with that win at Lambeau Field in the playoffs like maybe this maybe Tice is the guy maybe Dante is the guy and well, all right Dante Randy and that's but Dante was also now we're getting into 05 but let's start there with key question number 1 let's start with Dante two part key question i guess is that the most 2004 is that the most underrated season you guys can think of off the top of your heads in the last, in the, I would say in the Peyton Manning era, of course. So 1998, the last 22 years, is Dante Culpepper 2004 the most underrated quarterback season of that period? Underrated is subjective. I think it is one of the, and I don't even know if it's an outlier season, which is what I'm in, impl, you know, kind of inclined to call it because 2000, his first year starting, second year in the league. He was really good then, too. I think he threw 30-plus touchdown passes. He turned the ball over more, still ran a lot. Mm -hmm. What really you know, helped Dante take off, and this is you know, kind of a undersold part of what happens with Culpepper going into 05 and, where, and to Tice and to the organization, and you mentioned Red McCombs, is Scott Linehan, when he came in in 2002, immediately turned that offense. 02, Michael Bennett had his by far best rushing season. They were always one of the top teams rushing, and they were doing it out of a lot of three wide sets, which people weren't you know, doing a ton of in the NFL. I mean, he ran a different type of offense. People were trying to figure out how to adjust to it. So you know, how does that impact Dante? Well, it helps that he had players around him like he did. Now, Michael Bennett was a bit player by 04. His role had shrunk substantially, but you were you're rotating in. Mo Williams in there, Mueldy Moore was in there. Ontario Smith. You had a good group of receivers between Moss and Burleson and Kelly Campbell. Again, they got a lot of those guys on the field. They had a lot of speed, um, but they also it was a lot of quick passing. A lot of you know Dante his his completion percentage was way up in 04. A lot of those because it was you know. People weren't running bubble screens. They were doing that at 04. I mean, they were, it was the quick hitting behind the line of scrimmage, the quick hitting passes, and then they would take some of those deep shots. That offense really played to uh, Dante's strengths because it was forcing him to get the ball out, to make decisions quickly. He wasn't turning the ball over. He was being more efficient. And then, obviously, he was very talented in terms of uh, as a runner. You know, would that – here's one of the great questions is, yes, the injury happens in 05, but also Scott Linehan leaves after 04 to become the Dolphins' offensive coordinator. That's a lateral move. Why did he go? Because Red McCombs notoriously had one of the smallest and lowest-paid staffs in the league. If I recall correctly, they were only offering Linehan a one-year deal to return as offensive coordinator. Because, of course, Tice was, you know, in a year where he was going to have to win to be able to move forward. He didn't want to, Red didn't want to pay anybody to be, uh, you know, to not be coaching. So Linehan gets a three year deal from the Dolphins. And what are you going to do? Yeah. He, he, he takes it and he goes down there with Saban. And then the year after that, it works out for Scott. He goes to the Rams, gets paid a lot of money. Obviously, he didn't have a ton of success there. But, but Linehan leaving and that ripple effect on the offense, on the quarterback, that was a, that was a big deal, and it all comes down to the owner wasn't willing to pay a really good offensive coordinator who had one of the top offenses in the league and had his quarterback playing at a high level to stick around and not make a lateral move. And they, they were so cheap, too, that keep in mind, so Scott leaves in 2005, and I mean, this is cheap in college football, let alone pro football. Poor Steve Loney is promoted to the OC job. Offensive line coach. While still co- and yes, so he's the O-line coach. He gets the OC job, which, oh, man, you got the OC job. 
and they stick him with the offensive line too. Yeah. Which no, is, but Scott was coaching the receivers. Hey, but I mean, this Linehan is how, had two jobs. But this, so that's this, how small the staff was. Now you got assistant receivers coaches. They were they were doubling up, right? Well, and now you've got like linebackers inside, outside linebackers coaches, and you've got cornerbacks coaches and safeties coaches. They were McCombs was so cheap that all you had to do, I swear to God, was go to practice at w- Winter Park and look. And that those fields were in disarray. They were like high school fields at the time. And then the berm that w- went up towards the Winter Park building, the offices, was overgrown with weeds and absolute crap. And nobody until the Wilfs bought it came in and cut it down. Nobody did a thing. So, you know, and and that's the thing. Mike Tice had that job because Mike Tice would do it almost for free. And I remember, I remember uh, in 2005, they had one of the final uh, practices in training camp, but once it had gone back to Eden Prairie, they had sponsors there. And I remember being at this practice and Mike Tice comes down the stairs from his office and he has a cooler full of beers because there's going to be a bunch of sponsors there. The head coach of a team. Yeah. And he's hauling the cooler like a, like a football dad would <laughs> across the field. Although he probably wasn't complaining about that. No, right? he wasn't. But I mean, this is, <laughs> but, but this is, but any success that they had now in retrospect to me becomes all the more remarkable because of the fact that they were basically being run by Red McCombs like a Ma and Pa operation. Yeah. Tice, after the 04 draft, did the same thing, carried a cooler of beer to the media room, and we drank beers with the head coach of the team <laughs> immediately <about> <laughs> after the draft. I mean, that's what I mean by, like, it was it was a different time, you know, in that building. But you did. You had that collection of, you know, really interesting personalities and stars between Dante, uh, between Moss, and there's you know plenty more to unpack with, with Randy in that season. Um, you know, Nate Burleson's a TV star now. That was a thousand yard season in 2004. He was he damn was, good. That launched him into a Again, contract get, with Seattle eventually. They, they chucked it around, man. Like they, they had some offense and they ran the ball, you know, not at that same level that they had the year that I think Bennett was, I want to say he was number one in the league or the offense, the rushing offense was number one in the league, but they were still, they were effective. They could do multiple things well. Um, but they, they spread people out. They had all this speed on the perimeter and, um, you know, they had a good enough offensive line. I mean, they had, they had a lot of things going for them. It just, it didn't entirely sync up, uh, in terms of wins. Uh, but you saw it in the playoff game against the Packers that when they needed to make some plays, they had the dudes to make some plays at the time of Dante throwing for 4,700 yards. Uh, now we, now it, it happens every year. I mean, now it's like 5,000 has become much less of an eye popping number, but the only other quarterbacks to have thrown for that many yards or more yards in the season, Dan Marino in 1986, uh, Dan Fouts in 1981, Kurt Warner, 2001, and uh, Dan Marino, 1984. So only a small handful of quarterbacks had ever reached 4,700 yards passing, which is sort of part two to the Dante question. He was pretty bad before the injury in 2005 without Scott Linehan as the puppeteer and without and without Moss. Yeah. You lose your coordinator and you lose your best player. <laughs> yeah. So there were other circumstances in play when it comes to Dante's downfall as a starting quarterback. He had I believe six touchdowns to 12 interceptions at the time of the injury in Carolina. But if he hadn't gotten hurt and he's, he's and he's obviously he's, he he would have had one of the worst years of his career uh, career regardless. If he hadn't gotten hurt, mm-hmm. he was still in his prime. How does his career play out, do you think? Do you think his career was entirely buoyed and lifted by Randy Moss and Scott Linehan? Or if he had stayed healthy and had stayed somewhat mobile, would he have had another five, six, seven years in him at somewhat of a high level as one of the top seven or eight quarterbacks in the NFL, which is what he was before 2005? So I will begin this by saying if you trust Brad Childress's football acumen and think that Brad was – a smart football guy. And I know there are people that don't like Brad. But yeah, Brad Mm -hmm. knew personnel. I'll start this by saying Brad Childress, when he took the job here, after he left Philadelphia, very much was excited and thought, I get Dante Culpepper. And that was coming off the injury. But nonetheless, the whole thing with Culpepper, basically, he sort of, I think for Dante, I think for lack of a better term, sort of flaked out. Like he got hurt. 
well, I don't he think he knew what to do. In well, Florida, at a he strip at a strip mall. mall. At a strip mall. <laughs> but I mean, I think he sort of. I think he Wait, did sort of. Where at a strip mall? Like, a, like outside in the parking that's lot. That's the like great he was, children's quote. I right. can see. We asked. I, we said because he's like he's rehabbing at a strip mall, and we're like, Brad, what, what? And Brad said, yeah, I can see a Chinese restaurant. I can see any. I think he was right. I think it was like basically like a one hour photo, a Chinese restaurant, and then some 24 hour. A, a guy with a gym. Basically. Fitness. Yeah. But the point is, if you trust Brad on personnel and to Tom's point, I think he was pretty good. Brad Childress was chopping at the bit to get Call Pepper. So I think that helps to answer the question that if Dante doesn't get hurt, I don't know if he's got seven or eight years left at that point, but there definitely was a dynamic there that a head coach who knew personnel and offense was very excited to get him in a system that he thought would work. I mean, he was only 28 years old when he tore his knee up. How long did he last in Miami? So he spent he spent the next year in Miami, made four starts, and then Oakland in 2007, he made six starts, and then two years in Detroit, 08 and 09, 10 total starts across those two. So he never made more than six starts in a season after the knee injury. Because, I mean, I'm trying to think it. of even like a, a comparable to it to somebody who played at that high of a level and then was done that quickly. I mean, it, there's plenty of other positions. I mean, that happens all the time to running backs, for instance. It doesn't happen often to quarterbacks because you just you don't you're not devalued. Uh, that quickly, but... and, it, and it, like so, his mobility gets taken away, and like that's that was a huge part of his game. But we've seen quarterbacks that used to be mobile, and now they're not mobile, also, and their statues in that Linehan scheme. It's quick passing. It's behind line of scrimmage. It's short and that, passes. And that year, though, oh four, because I I remember covering the Packers and seeing him play twice in oh three, and then three times in oh four, and I was immediately struck by saying this guy looks completely different. Like he looks comfortable. He's making big time plays. But I really think if we're going to go into the path of what happened to Culpepper, I really think you have to go down the path of mentally. His knee, I mean, guys, I, I was there in, in Carolina, the game in 05. He didn't just sort of get hurt. It was a bad injury. His knee blew up. Mm -hmm. Like it was. The whole thing. The Teddy thing is, is really sad because he dropped back and it was sort of a mysterious thing. This was not mysterious, but he got hit by, was it Mike Minter was one guy who came in. And Chris, somebody, I think, was the other defensive back. But the point being, you could see it. His knee blew up. Like, that. this was no, oh, it's an ACL, Taron. He'll be back fine. This was, and I remember post-game in the locker room, he was crying. And I think it mentally screwed him up. Mm -hmm. I really, And he was never the same. And, of course, that's the, you reference him going the Dolphins in 06, Phil, and that's the whole thing where they had the choice between Breeze and Culpepper, and they're like, oh, we'll take Dante. They re rejected Breeze on yeah. his... His, his neck, right? But anyway, I shoulder, yeah, or yeah. But I think the path that we're going down with Dante is he was never mentally the same because the injury was for a guy who up until then had that mobility was so traumatic. He also played a lot on confidence. I mean, you remember like his celebrations, the rolling thing. Get your and, roll on. Yeah. But he would be like the way that he kind of interacted with people. He was very much. I'm not going to say he was a front runner, but he was definitely a guy who fed off the energy. And when he was playing loose and free, he was a lot better. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you, you take that away. And again, you take away his coach, you take away his best weapon. That's going to have an impact on anyone. Then you throw in a you know, career altering type of injury and new scenery. It's a lot to, it's a lot to deal with. All right. Next key question here. So stick with me on this one. If, if Randy Moss, was able through his whole career to stay focused on just being a great football player, not caught up in ego related things. Or uh, if, if he had focused even in the second part of his career, more on staying in the physical shape, maybe that he needed to, would we regard him as the greatest wide receiver of all time? And let me, let me spin off that I mean, for a he's second. Top. He's top three, 15, 10 all time. Anyway, well, I think I would say he's top. I think he's one of the three greatest receivers. I mean, we can look at he's he's not I mean, top three yardage era. wise. Modern era, Jerry like, Rice. To me, it's Jerry Rice. Some combination of Rice, Terrell Owens, Randy Moss, Antonio well, Brown was on that trajectory. And Moss we'll see is, what happens. I think the Moss to me conversation is. I don't think in my lifetime a single receiver has come close to changing the game as much as he did in 98. 
No, completely. So, like, we could get into where, where does he fall among, you know, T.O. and Jerry Rice. But I think if the question is, I mean, the Green Bay Packers used their first three picks in 99 on six-foot or taller defensive backs based on one guy. And, and I do believe that the National Football League looked at Moss after that year and said, how do we harness this? But, here, but here's the crazy thing. So as amazing as he was his first seven years in the NFL, all with the Vikings, or eight, seven or eight years, whatever it was the first step, he basically wasted – he went to Oakland for two years and got stuck with nobody at quarterback, it's Marcus Tuiasasopo, whatever. Um, so, he, so he has the injury season with the Vikings in 04 in which – he missed three games and was mostly a decoy for well, two games. The, right. Here's the other story with that. So the I believe it was the Tennessee game when he first hurts the hamstring. And it's very apparent he can't play. The Vikings know that. By Friday they know. There's no way. I, I can't think of a, a comparable situation anywhere in the league where that guy would be active on game day. But sure enough... Moss has started 100-plus games in a row. He doesn't want to not start a game. He goes out there, plays two snaps in which he barely leaves the line of scrimmage, like in his stance, and then like takes a couple steps, and then that was it. It would never happen. Yeah. But that was because Tice, this streak was so important to Moss. Tice wanted him to be out there. So he capitulated to a guy who he knew if he stopped his streak... It was going to blow up. Now, you know, a couple weeks later, Moss actually misses a game, then misses two games, misses three games. And, you know, it didn't matter at that point. But you don't see that. Those ro the roster spots, which, what was it, 45 probably at that time that you could have up yep. on game day? Yep. Those are too valuable to have somebody who you know can't play, yet they put them out there yep. for a couple of snaps. That was, that was one of the signs of, again, Moss is running this team not Tice, not Red McCombs, and that was the dynamic that became problematic. And he still had – so he basically only played in 10 or 11 games that year, even even though he's credited with 13. Um, and he still had 13 touchdowns, still had almost 800 yards receiving. He goes to Oakland the next two years, catches only 60 passes, does get to 1,000 yards in 2005. 06 was a complete lost season for him, 500 yards. Then he goes to New England for his age 30 to 32 seasons – Probably one of the one of the greatest seasons of any football player in history when he scores twenty three touchdowns um, in the in the undefeated 07 season. But here's what I'm getting at: his career was basically over at the age of thirty two. Yeah, he played for the Vikings for a minute, uh, and then he went to the Titans and, and bounced around Forty ers His career was basically over at thirty two. Jerry Rice played ten more years beyond that. Well, that's where Rice the the longevity and how long you know. You know, do we need Jerry Rice going to Seattle or Denver or no. whatever? I mean, Thank you. could have lived without that. But even in his Raiders days, Rice was still a pretty good no, player. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, you know, that's, it's always tough when you have guys who played a very short period of time at a really high level versus guys who played a long time at maybe a slightly lower level. We were talking about this at the Hall of Fame voting uh, a few weeks ago in Miami, where it was, you know, Tony Baselli was up for debate. And it's like, Tony Baselli only played seven seasons, and then his career was over. Maybe it was six. But it's like, but it, during those days, he was you know one yeah. of the best. Well, how do you compare him to somebody who might have played, you know, Steve Hutchinson, who was at the top of his game for eight, nine, ten but years? But if, if you're so – I've always said this to Judd, too. And it applies to baseball. Johan Santana, for seven or eight years, was the best starting pitcher in the entire league. And that matters more to me than if you played for tw if you're Jamie Moyer and you played for 24 the, the years. The judgment to me has always been, and I don't have a Hall of Fame vote, but what the argument that's always made the most sense to me is: was that player the best at his position for a period of time, yep. and how long was it? If you were the best at your position for three, four, five years in a you know league with 1,700 players, you're Probably a Hall of Famer. Was Randy Moss better at his position for a stretch than Jerry Rice was in his era at the same position? I mean, that's tough to because you because, could make the case for Moss. But Randy Moss, I mean, I, I don't, I don't remember Jerry Rice circa nineteen ninety one well enough to to make that judgment. I mean, he was he was really good, and he had the benefit of being on really good teams. Moss, 
outside of the 16 and 0 Patriots team lost to the Giants in the Super Bowl, how many great teams was he yep. really a part of? Moss also completely changed the game. I mean, he was uh, he was a, a, a star that burned bright and yes, burned out quicker than Rice. But I mean, there's only guys. Just as far as athletes go, there's only a few athletes in our lifetime who will do what Randy Moss did. And 98, 99, those years, they changed the league fundamentally. I mean, I, I just don't know, you know, Jordan in basketball. Now, basketball's a, a different sport, so you can continue to play. And in Jordan's case, you can continue to play too long, and it gets really pathetic and sad. But that changed the game. I'm trying to think of, guys, how many non-quarterbacks at football have come in and changed the game. And it's not like... Yeah, like Lawrence Taylor at linebacker. Yeah, and it's not like Moss's first QB was Brady. Randall Cunningham, God bless him, but he was retired. He played in or came back in 97 as a Viking. You know, played okay, but he was certainly not great. And then from Brad Johnson to Cunningham, it basically was like, throw that guy the ball, and oh, by the way, he'll catch it every time. And so to me, it's not like, well, let's compare Moss to this guy or that guy. And yes, the Moss that we saw by 2010 was a guy who had slowed down. He was a guy who he was a guy who his physical attributes in his prime were so unbelievably great. You weren't really shocked when you said, they're gone now. Because you never looked at Moss like, oh, man, he'll be around for a long time and he's going to reinvent him himself. But, I mean, in 2010, I always go back to the game in Green Bay. And Favre threw him a ball, I think it was in, in the back of the end zone, and he alligator, the the and he alligator armed that SOB. Mm -hmm. And you said, that's pathetic and really sad. But for what I got to see you do 10 years ago or, or 12 years back, or it was so great, I almost don't care. And I can't say that of a lot of guys. I mean, and Randy Moss could be a complete injury. A jerk, an utter jerk. And again, he was so damn good at one point, I didn't care that much. What was the smoking gun reason for why they traded him? It was, it was everything. It was, again, it was the dynamic where, like, if you were in the locker room in those days, and I was, you know, I was young, I was 23 years old being around that team. I, I didn't have a lot of frame of reference, but like in hindsight, it was just very obvious. And, and and you get this dynamic in different locker rooms where you'll have player, like just players who are just the loudest guy in the room. Right. They're just they're that guy. You hear him before you see him. And in order to be that guy and make it work in the NFL, as you guys try to quietly open those beers, uh, you have to be that talented. And Moss did I cook? Moss was that talented. Uh, you know, the but the series of things that happened that year between the hamstring and everything that played out with that, you have the issue in week 17 against the Redskins where Moss leaves while the Vikings are setting up for an onside kick attempt where hypothetically maybe Moss should be one of the guys on the field for yeah. that. I There's don't like, know. If, like two seconds left, but still, I mean. But Matt Burke had strongly worded things to say after and the game Tice about sent, that. Tice sent Burke after Moss, right? And then tried to back away from it. And that's he where Tice. took a long way off the field. Yeah, but I think Tice told Burke, go get him. And so Burke did. And then Tice was like, well, well, like, we got a problem there. So then, but then you come to the following week and you see the other part of Moss where nobody thought, I mean, the Vikings are an eight and eight team going into Lambeau field. And this gets us to, are we not to Joe Buck yet? Should I save that part? Uh, well, we're, we're getting there. You do this and then we'll segue into it. So, you know, that game, nobody thought the Vikings were going to go in there and win. There was no reason to believe they should win that game. It was cold. They'd kind of been banged up. They hadn't played well. You just thought this is going to be a game where Green Bay just is – they're too good. They got far. They got all these playmakers. You know, at that time they had some playmakers on defense too. Like there's – you don't have the horses. But, like, as you watch that game unfold – you you know you you saw the good parts of the Vikings. You saw what had made them dangerous uh, through the course of that season. Moss was a big part of it, and that gets us to the touchdown and the uh, the incident that is you know oddly enough of all the things Randy Moss accomplished in his career, uh, all the touchdowns he scored in that that season with the Patriots where they go undefeated, all the great moments, you know the Thanksgiving Day game in Dallas. I mean every every great game he had that image is one of the most enduring things with Randy Moss yeah. so all right key question number three here 
is it time to stop hating Joe Buck after 16 years? Moss. Randy Moss is in for a touchdown. Oh, Al Harris playing off. Bit up on the route, and Randy Moss, without even really being able to run, as he shoots the moon to the fans here in Green Bay. That is a disgusting act by Randy Moss, and it's unfortunate that we had that on our air live. That is disgusting by Randy Moss. All right, Minnesota Vikings fans, are you are you over it yet? I'll say this, Judd, you were in the same press box as me. Yep, at Lambeau Field. This yep. is January '05. I, I'm watching it. This occurs in the – it would be the south end zone of Lambeau Field, so it's to the right in the press box, which at the time was the open end of the stadium. Now they've built it up. There's a big scoreboard and there's a ton more seats. But at the time it was the open end of the stadium. you got more wind over there. It's like you're kind of – you're looking into it. It was getting dark because it was a later start. And Moss scores and runs toward the goalpost. From my vantage point, and Joe Buck, based on where the broadcast booths are, is not far off. He's down the hall. So he's looking at it from a similar standpoint. When Moss gets in the end zone and you see him drop the ball and simultaneously do the motion with his you know, his pants, we often call this, people call this the mooning instant. Let it be clear. He didn't moon anyone. He pretended to moon someone. But from my vantage point, because he pretends to pull down the pants while he's dropping the football, or you know, basically right after he drops the football, and then is shaking himself, shaking his rear end toward the crowd, I thought in that moment that what he was doing was pretending to take a dump in the back of the end zone <laughs> and then wipe himself well, on the goalpost. That's what it looked like. In the moment. Yeah. I've never gotten to ask Joe Buck about this. I've always wanted to. Whether he thought or at least was concerned that that's what they had just aired on TV. Because that I get the – that's disgusting. If you pretend to poop the football in a game, that's that's generally considered to be over the line. When you find out the actual backstory, the history of Packers fans mooning the visiting team's buses, you get it more what was happening. But in the moment, I was like – is he just pretending a dump in the end zone? <laughs> I thought the same thing, and it looked like he was specifically using the goalpost pad to clean himself up. That's what I'm saying. It looked and, like but, he was but, wiping himself but, on the goalpost. But to this day, I'm not sure you're wrong about that. To this no, day, I'm, I think he's dancing and, and shaking the booty. I has, think has, the he ever, he, has he ever done a follow-up interview about this? Has Randy Moss ever spoken I've publicly? I've never seen one. I've never I mean, seen... I've talked with Randy since then. I, I don't think I specifically asked him that, but... I mean, the explanation he went with was it was the mimicking the mooning of uh, the fans. And when you see it from the other camera angles, I think that's what it was. I just well, I know what I saw in that moment looked like something different. And the and the interesting thing about the entire Buck call is I think Joe Buck is also taken aback a little bit because that's back in. And by the way, nice three man booth back then. Uh, Collinsworth, Buck, and Aikman. That's right. Collinsworth and was the third. Collinsworth man in the booth. says. Randy Moss shoots the moon, and then I think Joe Buck, who who would have been to our left in the press box, but as Tom said, not far down, I think he saw what Randy did and heard Collinsworth say that and didn't find it to be as funny as Collinsworth did because his Collinsworth, to me, was amused by it. And so I think he was almost apologetic for, we just showed that, and my partner, who's 12 years old, thinks it's funny <laughs> and got caught up in the moment. And... I mean, I've always thought that that was one of the most ridiculous things of all time, overreaction-wise, from from the Joe Buck haters. And I, but I remember, so I, I was doing the sports media column for the Star Tribune back then. So I was in Green Bay. I st I stuck around for the wrap-up stuff from the Packers that season before I drove back here. And so that week, I was doing a bunch of stuff for the television coverage of the Eagles Vikings playoff game, which was the next game. And I remember talking to the Fox people and the Vikings people, and no kidding, Red McCombs seriously moved to have uh, Joe Buck taken off the telecast in I Philadelphia. Remember this. I remember this. And I remember yeah. talking to Joe, and he's just like, what? And he's like, it's just not that big a deal, and, you know, if people are offended by what I, you know, I mean, because in Joe's mind, and he's not wrong, he was right, but 
Red McCombs and the Vikings, of all the stuff that they allowed to fall through the cracks, <laughs> and God knows they allowed a lot of things to pun, fall uh, through the cracks, pun intended. pun intended, this was one thing where they were actually going to work their ass off, pun intended again, to get a guy banned <laughs> from the game. It's amazing. By the way, I, I didn't. Broadcaster. I had forgot that Chris Collinsworth what was the third guy in that booth, that which is another uh, impromptu key question. Is Chris Collinsworth, Troy Aikman, and Joe Buck low key the most underrated football broadcast booth ever? Think about that for a second. There were more three man booths back in the day. I'd well, you had go Moose, Goose, whole... and uh... no, no, that's not well, gonna, that's not going to count. Well, no. well, Goose was always on the field though. Yeah, and, Go- and Goose was just there to uh, be a comedian. <laughs> The best three man booth that I heard, just because it was because Cosell was just so great and hilarious, was Dandy Don, Cosell, and Frank Gifford back in the day. But as far as like what about uh, Tarico, Kornheiser, and, oh, and then Dennis Miller, Dennis but, Miller. But actually, to your point about low key, Tarico is one of the greatest of all time. I mean, best two man booths in the past twenty mm-hmm. years. Tarico with Gruden. If you know, yes, I agree. My right only there. my only regret about that booth is I so wish that Gruden never had a desire to get back into coaching because I always want him to rip more people. You would see it. The best part about Gruden in the booth was the final like six minutes of bad games where he'd start getting mad about what he was seeing. <laughs> just great. this is ridiculous. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and just start like you just feel it or like or during the long replay reviews like. I don't know what's taking so long, Mike. Can't believe it. Yeah. I think to what Judge just said, I think we're going to get, you know, who knows how long this 10-year contract, and if hopefully for John he plays the whole thing out. But I think after he's made that money, and whether he, whether he works six years of it or all 10 years, I think he'll go back to the broadcast booth. He's still young enough. and He'd want to be, with, he'd wanna be with, with Tariko. But then we'll get – more gloves off John Gruden Actually, you know, after this contract's over. That would work out very well, though. The eventual NBC team could be th- those two again because Col- be. Collinsworth. Is they were really, they were really close. Their families were close. Yeah, they got perfect. it wrong really well. There were some changes there, obviously. Um, back to the to the Buck thing for a second. I think the other thing, and I actually remember in my again in my youth here, writing a column for KFAN.com at that time. That was based on the premise of what would the Fox uh, reaction have been had that been Brett Favre who had had the same celebration. Yeah. And the answer is almost invariably Terry Bradshaw. I think it was the same group. It was Terry Bradshaw and Jimmy Johnson would have been yucking it up and thought it was the most hilarious thing ever that Brett Favre pretended to moon the crowd because it's Moss, because he has a reputation, because he's supposed to be the bad guy. It probably was handled differently than if it had been somebody else, well, like yeah. Favre, who at that time was the golden child of the NFL. And race, too. I mean, there's no question about it. Yeah. I mean, that, that comes in from, oh, Brett, the good old Southern boy. Yeah, Favre would have been. I, the, I, would, not, I, I would not go that far. I think that there's, in everything we do, there are latent biases. I agree with you on that point. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's that. I think it's just that, you know, Favre was hand, Favre had plenty of problems. Early in his career, yeah. I mean the painkiller stuff, and I mean there was a there was a lot going on with him. But he was somebody who just like you know all he ever heard was the love of the game, and you know what you know just look at him out there having the you know all the joy that he has from the game. It would have been the same reaction to the you know if you saw that Brett Favre's thirty four years old. Look at him shaking that thing out there. <laughs> you know that's what it would have been. Oh, I don't yeah. think it's a race thing. I think that's just like the way he was viewed versus Moss, who was the same guy who. Ran over the 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 traffic attendant and squirted the referee with the water he bottle. Moved, he moved her with his walked car. Walked okay. off the field the week before against the Redskins. The traffic attendant, and she wasn't even a cop. He just moved her a little bit with his car. They bumped her, and and then of course what they got <laughs> weed in in his car, and he had the great quote. I think the NFL knows what Randy Moss does with, but Randy Moss, I'll I, I'll give him credit for this above and beyond being a, just a freak athlete. Randy Moss also is one of the smartest players I covered. I mean, Randy Moss's intelligence level of football was super high. It was off the charts. Really? Yes. And so I think that's something. I think people thought, oh, my God, he's just so good. He goes out there and Randy Moss studied. Randy Moss had a lot. I mean, he put a lot of work in, I thought, behind the scenes to that success as well. Uh, Last key question for you guys here in regards to the 2004 Vikings, and it's more of a a zoom-out question about Mike Tice. So Mike Tice, 
I can spent, talk about Tice forever, by the way. Well, this this will give you a good runway here. So Tice had four full years as the Vikings head coach. In his final three years, with all the things you guys have already detailed, uh, of uh, an owner who is skimping on facilities, on staff, on maintaining a number, a head count on the coaching staff, who knows to what other areas that level of cheapness trickled down to, despite all those things. Mike Tice went 26 and 22 in his last three years, nine and seven, eight and eight, nine and seven, won a road playoff game at Lambeau Field, and yes, started six and zero oh and five and one and and stumbled. I'm not saying flawless, but I think we remember Mike Tice and the fan base remembers Mike Tice as like, oh, he's the jolly, lovable big guy, but eh, kind of a kind of a bonehead coach is sort of the key question. Last key question: Was Mike Tice a good head coach? I mean, it's a, it's a complicated question because I think that another coach in another situation who didn't have some of the other things Tice had to deal with, the Super Bowl ticket thing, and you know there were some other issues floating around with him, which is really the reason he never got another shot, frankly. Uh, you don't entirely know because of some of those restrictions he had. I mean, as you said, Tice, was, Tice is just one of the most likable people. Like, if you're going to have a beer with somebody in the NFL, you want it to be with Mike Tice. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, when I was over at uh, Bunny's a couple of years ago for the NFC Championship game uh, against the Eagles, that was my assignment for the day. And they dug out Tice's old sign from his parking spot. You know, like he was just, he was that guy. He was the guy you want to run into in the bar. Um, Judd's, you know, Judd's going to get one of those someday at Bunny's too, we're hoping. I'm politicking. At, at least at least a commemorative plaque. But he was, he was somebody who I think that, that that had a positive impact on his team at times. But the fact that he was also up and down was also shown by his team at times. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, one time before practice, he ran onto the field in his old uniform, full pads, That's the jersey, cool. everything. He ran out there, the neck roll. He ran onto the field in pads the neck roll. on like a Wednesday. I'd have to look up when it was. I don't remember if it was 04 or not, but he ran out there in the uniform. Nobody else does that. You know, he was, and he would joke about it. That was the other thing was like, he'd be getting, he'd be getting killed by the media, you know, and he was joking about, oh yeah, I'm coach collapse. You know, he'd be joking about it. (laughs) Uh, He was, he was very in tune with, you know, what he was, but for somebody who was a a career tight end, a tight ends and offensive line coach, you know, he, he, yeah, he, he won some games. He put the right piece in place. He got coaches to come in. He got players to buy in. It was just, there were some things that, Kind of got away with, got away from him, and then you know the Linehan thing was huge. The Culpepper injury in the big picture was big, uh, and Red sold the team. I mean that was the other thing was you know the Wilfs were obviously not going to, you know they were going to go their own direction, bring somebody else in. Brad Childers was in many ways the polar opposite outside of hairline. Brad was the polar opposite of Mike Tice, uh, you know, and then you know Tice bounced around, and obviously he was in Chicago for a number of years. He was in Oakland. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he was not a bad coach. I'll say that I know it's a low bar to clear, but he was certainly not a bad coach. He was a, he was a coach whose team reflected his personality. They, they had some really good times. They had some, some rough times. A little too. undisciplined. I mean, it really, yeah, you're right. So he got a great opportunity and he might not have gotten that opportunity because he took, took over when Denny got let go. He only kept the job because he'd work for $10. Uh, that being said, if Mike Tice's career path and career goal was to be a coach, that was the worst job he could have gotten because he was a good O line coach. And if he had ascended, if he had ascended ordinarily as a coach, I think he eventually gets an opportunity does he w- with more stability. It's I think, hard with offensive line coaches. I think he does because I think he would have learned more and been a little bit more grounded. I'm not positive, but my point is the Vikings' job in itself probably cost him any opportunity again because it was such a mess and it wasn't just all him it was red it was the whole thing um but yeah he wasn't a bad coach you can't answer the question phil in my opinion of was he a good coach or not though because it was so dysfunctional and there were so many things that were weird and not and there were some things that a different personality would have yeah. approached differently but but tom's right i mean they hired Childress based on the fact that they they wanted the opposite of Tice. And, in fact, it's funny 
because one of the guys who showed interest in Tice after he got fired here was Ted Thompson in Green Bay eventually. As a head coach? As a head coach because Mike Sherman had been like Childress. And that's football. You're always looking for the polar opposite of your <laughs> last guy. True. Now, Mike didn't get the job there, and I didn't. Th- I don't think he truly had a chance. Um, but the story that I've been told, too, was, so the Wolves get the team in 2005, and they keep Mike, which was actually pretty smart, because I think the Wolves' goal was to spend 2005 just observing things. Like, they knew. They're not dumb. They knew what they didn't know, which was a lot at that time. Uh, but supposedly, the reason why Mike got fired so abruptly because they played that last game against the bears in 2005 they won. and they won but so but and so post game we're in the locker room and if i'm not mistaken lester bagley comes through handing out a press release saying mike tice has been relieved of his duties yeah and this also went but by the way to nate tice mike's kid who was a ball boy who was Unaware his father had been fired. That was uh that that was one of the first I was in that locker room as yep. an intern. That was one of the one of the first locker rooms I was ever in was the Mike Tice <laughs> getting fired that's press heck, release circulating. That's a good experience. <laughs> um and that so, doesn't happen anymore. Another thing it doesn't happen anymore. Nobody hands out a press release that someone's been fired. But yeah. supposedly the reason why it was so abrupt and and seemed Bush League was because the Vikings had been on the road shortly before that. And they were having their I think it was Saturday night, but it was the day before game meeting. And one of the Wilfs, I want to say it was Lenny, came in late. And Tice dressed him down in front of everybody. You don't show up late to my meeting. You don't do this. You don't do that. And the Wilfs were like, oh, oh, we'll show you. And so they fired him in this completely abrupt. And the one thing about that post-game locker room was, I remember we were talking to players, you know, do you expect Mike to be back? And Because we all thought, oh, he's got, you know. A few more days at least, right? And so they all leave. And I remember going out to the player's parking lot, and I got Bryant McKinney. And Bryant Again, McKinney's because mom. you could just walk around and do whatever you wanted to well, do. And so I said to Bryant, I said, Mike just got fired. Can I get a comment? And Bryant takes the press release from him, and he reads, and he goes, damn, they lied to us. And his mom looked at me and goes, he's not talking to anybody. And then a cop <laughs> accosted me and kicked me out. <laughs> but, like, that's how – wild wild west this whole thing was <laughs> it was like being in like a weird football hbo movie yeah so man so the vikings uh the vikings are on a run of well you know denny green got a job with the cardinals but mike tice never got another job as a head coach brad childress never another never got another job as a head coach yeah. leslie frazier Never got another job as Still a head coach. Still might. I'm surprised Les didn't get a sniff this year. Yeah. And then uh, really? we'll see what happens with I Mike I thought Zimmer. he would, at minimum, get an interview. Oh. I mean, he was one of the – he's probably the one best the person I've ever humans. covered yes. in sports. Yeah. Which is saying a ton for football. Yeah. Like, to have a football guy qualify in, in that statement says a ton. But, yeah, they've had a run of – well, you think about – Childers got the job. And Brad, as Tom said it, and I think he's a 1,000% right, was a good personnel guy. But, man, the people skills were just lacking. It's hard to be and all Les of got, those things to a room of 53 and peripheral scouts and coaches. And in, I mean, think unless it's personal the, interpersonal relationships with Brad was really where it yeah. played. And then relationship with ownership. Unless, when, he, when he cut Randy Moss and didn't tell them. Yeah. And that was more or less the end for him. And Les got thrown into, again, a situation that was just really tough. Les went to the playoffs with Christian Ponder as quarterback. Yeah. Yep, and Les was also the guy who, what was it, 2011 in uh, Christmas Eve in Washington, celebrated a victory that cost him a, a draft. Peterson tore his, and it, uh, yeah. tore his ACL. And Peterson's knee was somewhere on the field, and Les like, hallelujah, yep. what a great thing. We're, we're not going to get my Christmas. No, he was. He no. still is the most relentlessly positive individual you're ever going to meet. Yep. Not going to get Andrew Luck, but good win at Washington that season. Uh, boys, thanks for doing this. The 2004 Vikings. A lot there to unpack, and I think I, we unpacked a lot of it. I just unpacked my early twenties. That's uh, <laughs> you, you guys want to do some shots of Ruben? How much right of this? Now? How how much of the two thousand four spin? How much the two thousand four season a, were you sober for? Or a tropics guy myself? I I mean two thousand four. I I couldn't afford to like go out every night. You know, it was like drinking bush light and eating TV dinners and. Hungry living, man. Living in a room at my buddy's house in Uptown. Like this. So you can find more episodes <laughs> of Minnesota Sports Rewind 
on Apple, Spotify, or the Score North app. And it helps when you give us a five star review on Apple and Spotify. It helps spread the word about the show. Thanks for listening.